Boot. Uh, David is the new co-chair of the CIPR Public Affairs Group uh, and also the Public Affairs Lead at the, David, do you want to just remind me, the National... So I uh, am Head of Public Affairs at the National Oceanography Centre as part of my day job. Thank you. Probably should have written that down. Um, so it's an incredibly topical and timely discussion today. We're going to be talking about lobbying, good governance. When we talk about good governance, it's, uh, it's as much about accountability and transparency as it is about doing the right thing. And this is where lobbying comes in. And it's a timely discussion because we uh, only last week or maybe two weeks ago, I was in front of a select committee giving evidence about the impact of uh, some legislation that came to force in 2014. Uh, which we will talk about a little bit on this, but there is some, uh, at least murmurs of changes happening on the legislative front, which we'll get into. Now, people have obviously different understandings and experiences of this issue. So forgive me, we'll start a little bit at the beginning. We're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, just for a second, what lobbying is. The CIPR define it here, discipline within public relations where the general intention of the activity is to inform and influence public policy and law. And um, the reason I mention this, um, the, the lobbying industry really was set up, uh, or, or lobbying has always happened, and it sort of emerged as a professional discipline, um, but an unregulated one, and never really formally recognised, and that was only until um, uh, very recently where that changed. Uh, we did see some self-regulation coming in, uh, and then uh, in 2010, this man uh, came along, became our Prime Minister, um, and, uh, and he gave a speech, a very sort of now infamous speech, if you like, where he talked and linked corporate lobbying to the lack of trust within, uh, within our politics, which was uh, even at a low point then. We can imagine, uh, since we've seen uh, events over the last few months, what that might look like now. But he said, and I'll, I'll quote, we all know how it works, the lunches, the hospitality, the quiet word in your ear, the ex-ministers and ex-advisors for hire, helping big business find the right way to get its way. Uh, and so it was his government that launched in 2014 the what is called the Lobbying Act. It has a much longer name, uh, but for this, uh, for purposes of, of brevity in this call, we'll call it the Lobbying Act. Um, and the CIPR raised concerns when the Act was uh, was going through Parliament um, because it was our view that the scope of the Act was not wide enough. The Act covers uh, consultant lobbyists. These are people that are paid um, by organisations to do lobbying uh, uh, and they specifically around lobbying ministers and permanent secretaries. So it doesn't include anyone that's in-house, uh, it doesn't include lobbying of opposition parties, it doesn't include lobbying of any backbenchers, any peers. Um, and uh, if you happened to, to have watched the session I gave to, to PACAC last week, uh, there were a number of concerns that we raised about some of what we see as loopholes. Um, events, ironically, involving David Cameron, if you can cast your mind back to the summer of last, uh, last year, um, thanks to some good investigative journalism, it was found that David Cameron had been lobbying um, the Treasury in particular with regards to um, some COVID uh, uh, schemes, which uh, were looking to, to sort of help businesses. He was working for a company called Greensill Limited. The, uh, the company went bust. And in the course of, of some of the information that came out following uh, the collapse of Greensill, it came out that David Cameron had been employed by them to lobby. Um, and he lobbied by texting and WhatsApping some of his former colleagues in the Treasury um, and some ministers as well. He lobbied Michael Gove, he lobbied Rishi Sunak, he lobbied some permanent secretaries, uh, where he essentially was trying to um, get Greensill's um, offer. I think he, in one text, he said, we're, we're riding to the rescue of government in front uh, of ministers and uh, as, as part of, uh, of government's procurement processes. And this kicked off a huge uh, outcry. And actually, a, a huge number of uh, journalists started looking for other examples of which there, there were sadly many, particularly of ex ministers or parliamentarians working to lobby. Uh, on behalf of people that were paying them. The issue, particularly with David Cameron and the case of Greensill was that he was employed by Greensill. And as I mentioned earlier, in-house lobbyists are not captured under the Lobbying Act. 
um, the lobbying act includes a register and no in-house lobbyists are not just required to, they're legally not allowed to register, but it's only for consultant lobbyists. So myself working for the CIPR, uh, I am lobbying for a change in law. I am not able to register and uh, acknowledge, be transparent or accountable to the fact that I am trying to, to, to get policy change. And this was the case with David Cameron. He broke no laws, despite the fact that it did seem uh, well, in certain people's eyes, to be you know, something that was slightly dodgy. He was using his personal contact to try and influence policy. But legis legis legislatively, there was nothing that he had done wrong. Um, since that particular incident, so now um, a year and a bit on, there have been no fewer than seven uh, inquiries launched some of you by the government. So the third one, the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, which I gave evidence to the other week, is an inquiry set up by uh, the then government, the Boris Johnson government, um, who also looked into setting up an independent inquiry, which became the Boardman Review. Um, the Treasury Select Committee, uh, Public Accounts Committee um, have all looked at it. And you've also had the Committee on Standards in Public Life, who wrote a report looking at a number of issues regarding standards within um, uh, within Parliament, uh, including lobbying uh, and the national orders as well. The, the key here, this is really in terms of laying out the legislative landscape, is, is that there are now a number of different voices coming from within and around government suggesting that legislation is not fit for purpose and that it needs to change, which completely reflects the view of the CIPR. It was the view that we had at the time of the Act going through Parliament, and it was the view that we still hold today which is why we're calling for a complete overhaul. Um, at the same time, you've also got uh, a national security bill going through Parliament, which will include a foreign uh, lobbying register, so foreign influence uh, lobbying uh, parliamentarians in this country. Uh, and the Welsh government are also looking at introducing a lobbying register. One already exists in Scotland, which came into force 2017, 2018. Um, you can see here, this is an extract from the Boardman Review. There are some quite strong recommendations here. Um, so if you are a lobbyist and you're employed by more than one organisation, which in the case of David Cameron uh, was the case, he, he recommends that that would need to be registered. Uh, also removing the exemption for those not registered for VAT. That's one of the loopholes that we identified in the Lobbying Act. Currently, you need to be VAT registered. So anyone doing lobbying under £85,000 has no need to register, which is quite a significant loophole. If you think about one, the amount of lobbying that you can do for that much money. Um, or secondly, as I raised in the, uh, the committee hearing, there are some examples we've heard of, not many, but where um, organisations have asked their lobbying firms to bill them in different times uh, of the year so that they can potentially avoid having to register. Boardman, which is the uh, inquiry set up by uh, Boris Johnson has recommended that that changes. Uh, and if you look at this uh, extract from the CSPL Standards Matter 2 report, um, it's a pretty damning indictment on the, uh, on the state of lobbying in this country. Um, another point that I had made was the fact that lobbying registers exist internationally uh, that do include in-house lobbyists. And when uh, there was an OECD report that looked at 22 registers, 18 of them include in-house lobbyists. The Westminster Register is one of four. So when we're talking about good governance, both from an organisational point of view, but also from a parliamentary point of view, we're not really um, doing as much as certainly other areas. Uh, yes, including the USA, including Canada, including the EU, but also a number of other countries um, across the EU and across the world that are clearly doing far more when it comes to um, declaring uh, the, 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 the very good work that lobbyists do to influence and inform parliamentarians and policy decisions. Um, this stuff, uh, yeah, this stuff really matters. Um, I'm going to hand over now to David to, um, to explain a little bit more detail about ethical lobbying um, and why, from his organisational point of view and from the CIPR Public Affairs Group's point of view, it's an area that we're giving some, um, some focus to. David, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, John. Um, I want to start, I guess, in a, a fairly positive frame of mind in the sense that lobbying is important. It, it has a positive 
role to play. I just want to touch on sort of three broad areas. One is it brings better policy. What you get from uh, lobbying uh, is the government able to talk to different organisations um, and shape legislation that is built on expertise. So that's the first thing I'd, I'd say. Secondly, um, it allows government to take in a range of views. Uh, there may be organisations that they have spoken to previously. It may be new organisations. It may be different types of expertise uh, that they are listening to and different problems that they're hearing. Um, it really helps uh, government to form the legislation that, that they require. Um, and thirdly, it builds trust between organisations and ministers. Um, so important, particularly uh, if you're a new government, you're reaching out to organisations, actually having those conversations is helpful for that relationship building. It's helpful to build that trust uh, that we need in a, a democracy. So not surprisingly from, from somebody who works in public affairs, public affairs lobbying is important and it is something that um, we need to be proud of, but also something that needs to be open and, and transparent. What you get from these stories here are a number of uh, scandals where um, lobbying is in the news for the wrong reasons. Uh, quite often the public will only hear about lobbying when uh, it's related to uh, a case where lobbying has gone wrong or there has been a case of uh, behaviour that is not, um, not appropriate. So John mentioned the, the Green Seal scandal, that's the, the bottom right, uh, David Cameron appearing again in our slides. Um, the others uh, relate to serving politicians, former ministers, current ministers. Um, the other one I'd mentioned was uh, Michelle Moan, which is the PPE one uh, in the bottom uh, middle. Um, so the Tory peer who lobbied a health minister to get onto the uh, VIP lane, so-called VIP lane for uh, PPE during the pandemic. Um, again, these are all uh, areas where these weren't consultant lobbyists. So the regulation that John touched on actually wouldn't uh, involve this type of activity, but in the eyes of the public, uh, lobbying has, has taken a hit. And it's seen that those uh, in, uh, in power or perhaps former ministers are then using their position. So we'll touch again on that sort of revolving uh, door of, of politicians and, and, and lobbyists. But just to highlight some of these areas where the public notice what is happening uh, and it does show that, that lobbying uh, matters and transparency and trust matter a huge amount as well. Um, next, next slide, please, John. So we at the CIPR uh, did a poll um, last year uh, to look at the um, ethics of public affairs, where the public are at at the moment. So the first one I highlight is 67% of UK adults feel the public should know more about lobbyists. So, so there is that sense that people only know about lobbying uh, and lobbyists, what they do with ministers and uh, MPs when there is a scandal. So actually, there is that desire to know more about, about the industry, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. 59% um, of uh, businesses, um, sorry, 59% of the public believe that businesses, organisations, such as charities, trade unions, pressure groups, should be able to meet with MPs and ministers uh, to promote their ideas. Going back to what I said earlier, lobbying is important. Uh, the role that listening to organisations has to inform better policy is really crucial in a, in a democracy. And we see that the public appreciate that and recognise that. So 52% believe lobbying can help create better policy and better law. What we see uh, at the bottom is 15% um, believe the public currently has, uh, sorry, 15% believe the public currently has enough information about who is lobbying. So that's incredibly low. Uh, the public doesn't have a sense of who's lobbying, what they're lobbying uh, about. So what you get from those figures is a sense that, 
yes, the public recognises lobbying happens and it's important, but actually it's not transparent enough. It's only visible when there is a scandal, usually involving a, a sitting member of parliament or a former minister. Uh, next slide, please, John. Um, so what we've done at the CIPR as part of our code of practice. So as a member of the CIPR, if you are involved in public affairs, you're asked to sign up to our uh, code of practice. So within that, we have 10 behaviours uh, of ethical public affairs practitioners. So the first one, when you're meeting a minister, you're meeting an MP, you're open about who you represent. Now, if you work for a consultancy, uh, that would mean um, making it clear that you are there on behalf of a client. But being open about uh, about who you are, what your uh, what your purpose is, is really crucial as a starting point. Secondly, do not attempt to mislead politicians or stakeholders. Hopefully that is um, fairly straightforward, uh, but not to use information in a way that is uh, is done to mislead a minister. Um, providing accurate and true information. So making sure that the information you provide to a minister uh, is, is accurate, it reinforces the points you want to make, but at the end of the day, it is uh, factually correct. Four, do not offer bribes or inducements, um, particularly uh, the case for those operating in different jurisdictions across the globe with different rules and regulations. Actually offering bribes is never the right thing to do, uh, regardless of, of jurisdiction. Respecting confidentiality, I think this works both ways. So respecting what the minister uh, tells you about government business, but also uh, ensuring that the minister uh, does not then divulge the information that, that you uh, perhaps pass on uh, regarding commercially uh, sensitive information, perhaps. So respecting confidentiality is really crucial. Respecting rules and regulations of government and institutions. Hopefully that, again, is, is fairly uh, basic when you come to public affairs practice, but making sure that the rules and regulations are followed in everything that you do as a practitioner. Number seven, respect the public's right to know about lobbying activity. We'll touch on this from a, a CIPR perspective in a moment, but, but making sure uh, when you're doing what you're doing as a public affairs professional, actually there is a, uh, a public interest element to what you're doing and the public has a right to know. So whether you're on the register of uh, political consultants or whether you're in-house, actually there is a, uh, a public reason why the public wants to know about what you are doing. Uh, so uh, that is certainly part of our code of behaviour. Number eight, respect rules and codes around employing politicians. Um, we've touched on this with, with David Cameron and, and Greensill. From a CIPR perspective, we certainly believe there should be uh, a greater gap between when a minister steps down and the chance for them to then join a uh, an organisation to lobby uh, the government on their behalf. Um, at the moment, it's it's fairly uh, it's fairly loose uh, as much as within this space, but actually there should be uh, a greater gap uh, to stop that revolving door that we've seen in previous years, which. Uh, adds to many of those um, scandals that we've highlighted earlier. Um, managing and avoiding conflicts of interest. Um, this is always uh, crucial. Um, so making sure uh, when you're meeting uh, that you're meeting on a particular purpose uh, and, and making sure that um, you are clear about what you're doing and that there are no conflicts uh, of interest uh, in those conversations and in those interactions. Um, number 10, not using access privileges or passes to lobby. What we have seen in recent years is a number of members of the House of Lords giving parliamentary passes to commercial organisations. What this means is that they can access the parliamentary estate, which in reality helps them to have more meetings with parliamentarians. This isn't something that should happen. Uh, 
parliamentary passes should be for those with a uh, specific reason to have that pass um, and having access to a member of the House of Lords uh, to give you a pass is not is not a reason. So that really is an area where we would like to see um, tightened up and is one of our uh, 10 when it comes to uh, our uh, code of practice. Uh, next slide, please. So just to touch on where we are when it comes to registering lobbying activity. So there are several lobbying registers in the UK. The only official government one is the Office of the Registrar of Consultant Lobbyists, which is uh, the one that John referenced earlier. This is run by UK government. Um, it is legally required within those parameters that, that John set out around uh, being a consultant lobbyist and meeting the VAT threshold as well. Um, the, the times that consultant lobbyists need to uh, Add in information is also quite restricted. So it's when um, ministers are contacted or permanent secretaries. Uh, so it is quite a defined uh, register in its current form. And there are costs associated with that as well. Perhaps a more expansive register is the Scottish Lobbying Register run by the Scottish Government. That includes lobbying of all MSPs, uh, Scottish Cabinet Ministers, uh, SPANs, which are special advisors, uh, and senior civil servants as well. Uh, and there are no costs associated with, with that one. Touching on the CIPR's uh, register. So we launched the UK lobbying register. Uh, it's not legally required. We do ask those who join the CIPR and work in public affairs to sign up. Uh, also, for those who are not members, there is the option to sign up to the register as well. Um, it's for everyone. So it's not just for consultant lobbyists. It's for those working in-house as well, like myself. There are no costs associated with it as well. So what we hope we have created at CIPR is an open, transparent register that uh, will allow for a better picture of the industry to be uh, to be shown and for those in the industry to really show that they are committed to transparency. The fourth one on this list is the uh, Public Affairs Board by the PRCA. Um, again, not legally required uh, and also open to uh, all organisations to join with a cost uh, associated to that. So what you see is quite a range of uh, registers um, and as John touched on earlier, there are so many constraints with the current um, consultant lobbyist register that actually the CIPR felt the need to create a, a more uh, expansive register to show um, those in the public affairs industry are operating at the highest uh, levels and with the highest um, ethical standards. Next slide, please. Um, so what are we at the CIPR calling on the government to do? Well, we within the um, CIPR's public affairs group uh, had a, a look at this uh, last year and put together a, a paper on what we would like to see. So the first one is a registration of more lobbying activity, covering a wider scope and more lobbyists. Um, what we know from the current setup is we are only capturing a small fragment of lobbying activity. By the term we, I'm saying that the government uh, register as it currently is framed really is just capturing consultant lobbyists. What we're not capturing is lobbying by law firms, management consultants, and those working in-house. Um, what we would like to see is the registrar of consultant lobbyists to become a registrar of lobbying. So the word consultant within this uh, regis register is so limiting. So it doesn't include David Cameron working for Greensill. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, in include Baroness Moan uh, campaigning on behalf of her own company. Um, it doesn't include those working in-house. It really is 
a, a constraint on the current uh, register. So we would like to see that uh, changed and the, uh, the register expanded. Um, what we know in public affairs is that it's always changing what the current rules around uh, registering show is that there's been little um, consider consideration taken account of digital solutions when it comes to how you can register that lobbying activity. Um, we all use um, apps on our phones every day. Surely there is a way for uh, the register to record interactions in a digital way. Uh, and that also goes for the publication of ministerial diaries as well. So using uh, technology in a better way to increase the types of information that we have uh, and making public affairs more transparent, we think is really important. Um, again, we touched on this earlier about that revolving door. So we think there should be a review into the length of time ministers leaving office uh, and taking up employment as paid lobbyists. Um, what that led the time could be, um, we are happy for obviously there to be a consideration of what that what that might be, what, what works, but actually at the moment we don't see um, uh, a, a sufficient gap between somebody leaving office and then them uh, lobbying their former colleagues. So that really does um, threaten to undermine lobbying, um, which is something that damages not just uh, the politicians themselves, but also those working in wider public affairs uh, as well. Um, and lobbying regulations need to be reviewed more regularly um, at no less than five year uh, intervals. Things change. Uh, the way uh, people lobby changes as well. Um, something that we checked in with the registrar recently was the use of WhatsApps and whether they are included within the definition of electronic communications to ministers and uh, permanent secretaries, which they are. But I think something like that and the fact that we had to ask the question does show that lobbying regulations do need to continue to think about how people are lobbying and making sure that the regulations are fit for purpose. So I will pass back to John, who will talk about what we're doing as the C CIPR uh, and lobbying for good lobbying and the launch of that campaign very soon. Thank you very much, David. Um, that was excellent. And we didn't even rehearse changing those slides, but I think we ended up doing that quite well. Um, yes, so as David's pointed out, there's a lot of reasons as to why we think that the, the state of the legislation as it is, uh, is not fit for purpose. And as he very clearly outlined uh, earlier, what we are calling for. Um, as I explained at the beginning, there is some suggestion that things will change. Now, it's true that the government um, that launched the inquiries, the Boris Johnson government, um, was a few governments ago. Um, we, we haven't had great interaction um, with any of the two previous, uh, well, with the current or the previous administration for obvious reasons. Um, but it's an area that we don't want to let go. And it's clearly an area that is continue to, continuing to sort of drive front page stories, as we saw with the uh, with the Lady Moan story and uh, and undoubtedly journalists are still looking for those stories. So I can reveal today exclusively, if you like, that we are in the next couple of weeks launching a new campaign called the Lobbying for Good Lobbying campaign. And we would be delighted if everyone here was to take part and participate, uh, join in, show their support for it. We are launching um, it in Parliament on the 13th of December. Um, my colleague Liam may be able to put the link, uh, I think he's just done that. So if you, um, we'll, we'll send this round again if you can't access it right now, but there is a link to register to that event. We are um, going to be holding a question time style debate um, with a panel of experts um, and we will be inviting parliamentarians to the event to show their support. Uh, and you are welcome, very welcome to join us. Essentially, we will be making sure that the government does 
understand the need to take this seriously um, for reasons that we've explained, but it's an issue that's not going away. And the issue of public trust is an important one for both sides of the party. It takes two to, to lobby. Uh, when you think about the, the trust in, uh, in, in both uh, our political institutions, but also in business, um, it's incredibly low. And we think there is an incredibly important opportunity here for us as, uh, as lobbyists and as people who hold ourselves to high standards to be able to demonstrate that, which is why the UK Lobbying Register uh, exists. And it's a very important way for you to demonstrate your organisations and your own commitment to those high standards. Um, please do join us on the 30th. We'll, we'll happily take some questions about that. But I just want David to uh, please explain a little bit about the UK law. But David, I wonder if you'd just be able to talk in a little bit more detail about the UKLR, what it involves and why it's important. Thanks, John. So um, we've touched on the, the problems with the current um, regulatory framework. Um, so the CIPR has uh, launched um, uh, a UK lobbying register. Um, what we're keen is for organisations and uh, individuals to, to sign the register. It's open, universal, free. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you don't have to be a member of the CIPR to, to join the register, but we really think it's important uh, to, to show uh, that we as uh, an industry are, are taking the lead when it comes to uh, better transparency within uh, public affairs. So we think that being on the UKLR highlights three things. One is it shows that you're accountable to a recognised industry code of conduct. So back to those 10 uh, principles within the CIPR's um, uh, code of ethics that I highlighted earlier. Um, really important, I think, when you work in public affairs to show that what you do is, is done to the highest standards. Um, it shows a commitment to conduct lobbying in plain view. So people can search the register, find organisations, find individuals. So it certainly meets the requirement that we highlighted um, previously in the polling that we uh, undertook, that there is a desire from the public to know more and to actually provide these platforms uh, is really important for the industry to show that it is uh, acting in a transparent way. Um, and thirdly, committed, it shows as an individual that you're committed to the common good of the lobbying uh, profession. Um, so the CIPR has really taken uh, a leading role in this. And I think signing up to the register just show that you're part of um, the, the debate for reform and you're part of an organisation that really pushes for the highest standards in transparency and openness. Um, and oh. I think, John, we're probably at the end happy to pass back to you and obviously happy to answer any further questions that anyone has yeah absolutely thank you david just on that uk law point so david made, made it earlier but i'll hammer it home it is a requirement any cipr member that is engaged in lobbying activity or conducts lobbying activity is required to to register to it um but it is open to anyone and anyone that isn't a member immediately agrees to sign up to the cipr code of conduct um, which means that they can be removed from the UK lobbying register should a uh, complaint be made. Uh, but it also gives people the, uh, I guess, power to be able to say um, when we went back to that list of the 10 behaviours, if there are concerns about things that they're being asked to do, either by their employer or even by parliamentarians, um, the Code of Conduct gives them a bit of a, a safety net to be able to say, well, actually, no, I'm signed up to the CIP Code of Conduct, I take this seriously. Um, Again, my colleague Liam has just put the link to the UKLR in the chat. So do have a look um, and please get in touch if you have any questions about it. One, whether you uh, think you should be on it uh, or two, if you have any concerns or queries about registering yourself and or your organisation. Um, you'll see um, uh, some links here, including ones to the UKLR, which might be uh, of interest. Uh, it also includes a link to our uh, policy position on lobbying. Um, I can see one question in the chat. I'll quickly jump into that and just uh, ask anyone that is uh, or does have any particular questions, whether it's about uh, what's coming up uh, with regards to, um, to, to the various inquiries that we spoke about before, um, whether it's regarding some of the details about what we're asking for, 
whether it's about the launch of the campaign uh, or UKLR, do feel free to, to drop them in or just even feel free to share your thoughts. Um, David, thank you, uh, Dave, excuse me, thank you very much for your, um, your question. Uh, so you've asked about how in-house lobbyists would be defined. Um, I'll just read the question, but for example, would it be everyone who works in a government affairs team, would it include the MD who attends events or senior leaders who has external responsibilities? Uh, great question. For the purposes of the Lobbying Act, um, the definition of an in-house lobbyist includes all of those examples. Essentially, is it is anyone on the payroll of an organisation. If uh, a consultant lobbyist uh, in, in, is defined otherwise as someone who is um, not uh, on the payroll, but is brought in as a consultant, as a third party, um, is the language that's used within the Act. Um, so that's where those two definitions sit. There is a very specific definition of that. Um, in terms of how we would define that, uh, yes, it would be, um, what, actually a better way of answering this is that it's what we're looking for is a register of lobbying activity rather than a register of lobbyists. Um, and so irrespective of the role of the individual that we're talking about, whether it is a CEO or someone who specifically has public affairs, government affairs, or lobbying within their, their role uh, and their job title. Um, it is the act of lobbying that needs to be registered. Um, and that's where we feel that then there is a significant gap. Right now, the definitions that we have um, that uh, fall under the legislation mean that it's incredibly tight and incredibly narrow. Uh, and some estimates have suggested it's only capturing around 4% of lobbying activity in this country. And as I explained earlier, when you look at other, um, certainly other developed democracies, um, we are an outlier in that respect. So we are looking to capture the lobbying activity rather than simply just um, the lobbyist. Put it another way, we have the, the, the registrar, which is the uh, office of the registrar for consultant lobbyists. We want to take the C out of that, uh, take the consultants out and it just become the office for the registrar of lobbying. So I hope that helps. Um, uh, unless there's anything else, we hope, uh, one, that we see you on the 13th. Uh, if you aren't able to attend, I appreciate it's in London, it just so happens there's a train strike and the small matter of a World Cup semi-final on the same day. Um, but if you are able to attend, we promise you a very good evening. Uh, but beyond that, you will hopefully see a lot more from us uh, with regards to that campaign in the next uh, in the next few months as well. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you everyone very much for joining us. A huge thank you to David for taking time for uh, presenting today. If you have any further questions, uh, feel free to drop us a line um, if you don't want to, to, to talk within this conversation uh, and want to take it offline, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you all and hearing from you very soon. Thank you very much.